Hello, everyone. Welcome to the unfinished business. Today's topic that we're going to be discussing is are we minding the gap and digitally proofing the future? It has been recently reported that the UK is on the verge of a shortage of digital skills, with only half of employers currently able to provide the necessary training for employees to bridge this gap. The number of young people taking IT subjects at GCSE has dropped 15% since 2015. While according to research from LinkedIn, the professional networking site, 150 million new technology jobs will be created in the next five years. So will we have the people to fill them? I'll let the panel introduce themselves. Hello, my name's Dr. Catherine Robinson. I'm a senior lecturer in Applied Economics and Business Statistics at Kent Business School, and I'm the Deputy Dean. Hello, my name is Hilbert. I'm a senior lecturer uh, in FinTech in the Department of Accounting and Finance. And I've been working with industry for many years. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lewis. I'm a student at the University of Kent. I've just finished my final year of international business. Uh, I'll be moving on my studies to a master's in computer science. And I'm also a, starting two businesses, the Reality Room and the 3D printed educational models. Hi, my name is Lance Younger. I'm the CEO and founder of ProcureTech, um, which was founded recently um, to basically concentrate on digitalization of uh, the procurement function. But before that, I spent 20, 30 years in procurement across a number of consulting, industry and technology businesses. Lovely. Thank you so much for joining us today, panel. So we'll start off with the first question, which is, where do you think the burden of responsibility lies for a shortage of digital skills in the UK? I'll start off with Dr. Catherine Robinson. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I think it's pretty well recognised that digital digital skills are a very valuable commodity in uh, in business in today's um, society. There's some evidence from 2017 that suggests that those with digital skills earn significantly more than those uh, uh, with other with other skills, and um, and also that indicates that they contribute positively to both profitability and productivity of businesses. So we know that there's a gap and we know that um, uh, we know that organizations are struggling to ensure that they can fill that gap. Um, I have been doing some research recently with Kent uh, small businesses looking at a pilot study of organizations seeing which SMEs engage with uh, um, AI, digital technology, uh, big data and robotics and looking at the extent to which that they identify themselves that there are gaps in the availability of appropriate um, resources, uh, appropriately skilled individuals. It's interesting to see that there appears to be quite a trade-off between those that identify gaps and those that are seeing a need to provide those training skills themselves. So there's, um, I think there's a there's a disjoint in terms of people's understanding between what education should do and what training should do in terms of how appropriate that training needs to be for that specific business, as opposed to those generic training, that, that generic skills base that can be gathered more through an educational uh, route. So marrying up those two different sides, I think is the challenge that we face at the moment. So, so in short, I think everybody has a role to play from schools right through to universities as well as employers. Lovely. Thank you so much. So next, Dr. Herbert. Uh, yes, let me start from the very beginning in 70s and 80s, where the term of digital literacy was in place. Uh, at, at that time, uh, we realized that we need to address the problem of digital literacy and computational literacy. But over the time that evolved, uh, and after that, obviously, we had net literacy. But over the years now, uh, at the moment, uh, because uh, the technology has become aggressively progressive, we are entering another era, which is called uh, tech literacy and the era of AI literacy. I think over the years, uh, UK has been uh, to some extent successful to address digital and computational literacy. There have been programs, uh, people at my age remember, for example, the ZX Spectrum, very tiny computers that was create, were created for people like us as kids to learn about computers. And nowadays we have Raspberry and Pi Foundation and the BBC Computer Literacy Projects. 
but it seems that we are stepping into another uh, important era, and that is the era of AI and tech. Uh, for example, we have big data, we have machine learning, we have many things in place that uh, adds to the burden of, of all literacies that we need in our uh, community and in our society. I think uh, the main problem here is that um, uh, actually economy and technology is developing uh, much faster than the educational body. Uh, educational body is not very much uh, coping with this problem at the speed that they need to. Uh, and that very much is on, I, I, I would say, all the levels of, of, uh, of education. Even you see at nurseries now, is, uh, very small kids uh, have the opportunity to work with, for example, something like computer or tablets, or even at home they have uh, access to tablets. It, it, this is obvious to everybody. So I'm saying it's not uh, of only one level, at all levels we need to address this problem and uh, take into consideration that the speed is much higher than we expected. Some of that is taken by private companies like Google, they have some programs to help for that, but I think it needs more effort. Uh, for example, in universities, we are uh, coping with this problem by introducing uh, technology-related problems. For example, introducing uh, topics like uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, uh, robo-advisories, uh, robo FinTech, that uh, would be the reality of the, uh, of the future generation. So I think uh, the, the problem at the moment that I see, except uh, what have been explained by Catherine, is that the speed of technology is much, much higher than the speed of education body, educational body to cope with the problem. Okay, thank you so much. So next we have Lewis Squire. Perfect, thank you. Uh, yeah, following from your points, obviously, I, I look at this from a student perspective, uh, both as a young person and a student. Um, and obviously, when I when I was at even the secondary school, we didn't really have much access to IT and different digital uh, aspects of education. It's only since obviously come to university that I've, I've managed to both experience uh, through my course, but through my own sort of uh, desire to learn. You know, um, I've always had a desire to look into the future to sort of understand what new digital uh, aspects there will be and what new opportunities that will face. Um, but I don't think a lot of students fully understand the potentials that digital bring. Um, students use tech obviously every day and, and even following uh, COVID, we've obviously had to adapt to using Teams and using different resources online, but that's only one part of digital. And I, th I feel that students don't really understand what opportunities for the future they're based. You, know, you, haven't, you haven't got to have a computer science degree or you haven't got to go into digital. You can cope in all different areas. You know, I, I'm a business student, but I'm using technology and, and different types of digital for my businesses. So there is the capacity to sort of learn and grow. Um, and I've done a lot of that through, say, online resources, even down to sort of YouTube, educational tools and different websites um, to sort of learn and sort of grow my understanding of what digital can actually do. You know, I'm using quite new tech like VR and additive technology such as 3D printing. Um, and a lot of that I've gained through, you know, online resources, sort of learning as much as possible in my own free time. Um, and a lot of that comes also from talking to people. You know, I've gained a lot of opportunity uh, just talking to one person who would then pass me on to another and another and asking questions and gaining loads of information that then will further me, um, hopefully in the future, which is why I've decided to carry on my studies with a master's in computer science. Perfect. Thank you so much. So next, Lance Younger. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, I, I'd agree with all the comments that have been passed uh, so far, you know, that there is a... a, a you know, it's the responsibility sits at all levels, you know, from education through to business, through to the re-education of people when they're going through their careers. Um, and I would say as well, the big thing for me is that if you think the technology is out there, it is, um, and somebody somewhere is using it already. And I would say the supply of technology has um, 
sort of exponentially grown over the last five to 10 years where historically people would ask to try and do things and they couldn't do them because the technology wasn't available, but now it's available. And it's a case now of not just saying, does blockchain exist, but how do we apply blockchain at scale? Um, what we're finding um, when we work with businesses or and what I've found is I've worked with businesses from you know, Barclays to GSK to Dyson to, to Nissan to Nokia, is, is basically that those leaders that adopt the technology the fastest then benefit. Uh, and they benefit not just from a, say, a reduction of risk or a reduction of cost or access to innovation, but people want to come and work in those environments. Um, they want to work in an environment where digital tools are being used. And you're right, as uh, Herbard said, was you know, you're using it in your day-to-day -day lives. You want to be able to use the equivalent tool or better when you're, when you're in business. Um, so survey after survey that we see being done, and it's just in the procurement world, but it's the same everywhere, basically calls out the leaders, the digital leaders are basically outperforming others. And the gap is not getting smaller, it's getting bigger, which is perverse in that most more, more and more technology is available, but people aren't using it. Their leaders are using it more. Um, and so, so things are changing. Um, you know, from my perspective, you know, responsibilities sit at all levels, but fundamentally businesses need to kind of embrace not just the technology, but new operating models. So that means structure yourself in a different way. It means have different types of roles that people have, you know, accentuate those roles as well. So that basically you can draw, draw more people through. Um, and I think perhaps the hardest thing for people to do is stop doing the old stuff. Um, because, you know, it, it's, it's this kind of trade-off in life where you can, you can do everything, but you can't. Um, and you're much better off saying, I often say this with the, my clients when I work with clients, is if you want to train people, then, you know, you can spread your training budget across everything. But in reality, you're probably better off saying, well, okay, we will you know, only put all the budget this year or most of the budget this year into this one area so we see a step change and i think it's the same with digital people need to say look am i going to train on the same old skills that i've always trained on or i'm going to put all my budget into this or am i going to employ people in that area so you know businesses have got a big role to play in pushing the boundaries a lot f further um yeah Thank you so much. Thank you, panel. Some very interesting points that are coming along. So now I'd like to do some directed questions and I'd like to start off with you, Lance. Um, can computers really negotiate better than real people? Is it archaic as a business to still rely on real people to implement your business processes? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, a raging debate going on in procurement at the minute about, you know, because at the core of procurement, which is where I work, it's, it's negotiation. Um, and you've got thousands and well, millions of people who work in the procurement saying, well, surely we won't see automated procurement. Uh, but the reality is it's, it's happening. Um, whether you see some of the more complex trading um, examples of negotiation, which Herbert, you, you'll be familiar with this. You know, you go into trading floor. I used to work at Goldman Sachs and all that trading floor is, is negotiation around you know, points of bit of information. It just hasn't been applied at scale in a more traditional environment, but that's happening now. Um, whether it be the, some of the low value items where it's been automated through to more uh, high value um, items where we're using you know, small bits of technology, robotic process automation to automate parts of the process or more complex negotiation platforms using machine learning and AI to basically identify opportunities for negotiation, but also to automate the negotiation process. And, you know, there's, there is, as you'd expect, a huge amount of train, change management involved in it and people letting go. But the funny thing is, is that a lot of the, the suppliers who have been negotiated against are actually saying it's a better experience um, because they don't end up with any of the old school, you know, thumping the table, you reduce the cost. And, and you also end up with transparency. It's clear, it's transparent, you know, you know where you stand um, with the process. So applied in the right way, you know, negotiation is, is rapidly changing, becoming more automated. 
it won't ever all be automated. There'll always be a touch of relationship and a touch of setup and a, a bit of intelligence, but it is something that's that's rapidly rapidly changing because of that. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. So next, I'd like to move on to Dr. Catherine Robinson. Um, you have done a lot of research into digital skills gap locally in Kent. Now, what did you take home from the studies that we can implement now to ensure that we don't face a crisis in the future? So I think um, I think it's been really interesting listening to um, the panel talking from their various perspectives, and I, there were a few things that came out from that. There's there's firstly the the time pressure that we face. We can't afford to wait for skills to be developed and for it to come through the educational system because businesses are needing to use this technology and effectively now. And so we have to make sure that we have entry points at each of those different levels, I would say. So so it is going to be require some changes in how we how we deal with these topics at, at, at primary school level. At, but it, at the same time, we need to make sure that there's a dialogue between businesses and at the moment universities to make sure that we are equipping our students as best we can for uh, the real world and of course the thing is we don't really know how this technology is going to be deployed um, beyond the next couple of years so what we have to equip our students with is that really focusing on those graduate attributes thinking about resilience thinking about that adaptability and uh, it was interesting listening to lewis talking about how he has access different skills so not the knowledge that was necessarily required purely through his degree but learning how to learn through other techniques and about other topics and i think we have to make sure that our our graduates are open to that that approach and are able to access those resources and that knowledge in order for them to hook on to what they want to want to look at. So I think I think that's probably one aspect, developing that love of learning that will sit with people as they move through their various careers, because gone are the days where, you know, people are looking at one job for the rest of their life. So I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing, uh, and I'd alluded to it in part before, was this idea that uh, uh, in-house training is somehow substitutable for labor market hiring so you can actually complement those skills gaps internally by making sure that you target your training to exactly what you need that's quite specific to the firm and to the organization and then just to pick up on something that lance was talking about earlier as well thinking about the fact that um, this isn't just a case of how ict was 15, 20 years ago, where you had a PC that sat in the corner and helped you to run your business. This latest wave of technology requires people to rethink their business models, to do things completely differently, to start from a different point, to configure themselves differently. And that has to be done, I think, in dialogue with education providers in order to ensure that we can then uh, support as best we can as, as as that goes through i think so so i think it's it's um it's a case of making sure that we access all areas as quickly as we can and ensure that that dialogue takes place so that we can we can support as best we can so i think those were the kind of the main the main points but we certainly don't know what we're training people for i think that's quite that's quite interesting definitely thank you so much for that so next, I'd like to ask Dr. Herbert. So what are the biggest areas of digital growth, in your opinion? What should we all be learning more about? Wow, this is a really interesting question because uh, if I want to associate digital to tech, let's, let's do this association because I think even in our discussion, we had more of technology uh, using this word. Um, it's everywhere, right? For example, we have it in health, economy, governance. So there is no, no place left that you cannot see any uh, intervention of the technology. And uh, that is why, say, all the areas now need uh, people to uh, be knowledgeable about these things. Um, 
on the other hand, I want to emphasize on the point that Lance was talking about. So, because that was really interesting. Um, from his conversation, you, you can understand that um, uh, we, a technology is accessible now to everybody, right? So it is a, not about how to access the education knowledge or something like that. It's how we want to do it, right? So um, these days we have technology in place to automate things, right? But more automation doesn't mean that we need less skills. Actually, we are giving up some skills that can be automated, can be uh, give, uh, given up uh, to computers. But on the other hand, your people like to, to now uh, take on higher skills. This is a, a very uh, interesting discussion. We have this in this very interesting book of uh, Professor Agrawal at uh, Toronto University. The book name uh, is uh, Prediction Machines, where he explains all this through that uh, for example, an example that he brings is that in, in old days, people had the skills to do the accounting, but now the Excel sheets are doing that most of the time, right? So now you have to think of a higher level of things, right? It's not that you can add up the numbers and you become skillful, right? It is now Excel sheets, sheets are doing that, right? So that is why you have to think of now the scenarios or something that is, uh, needs higher level of, of skills, right? I think this is something that is going to happen in future. And we can think of any area, uh, as I said, uh, that we, we are the people with higher skills. We have to uh, actually uh, narrow this gap. That is why I cannot name any specific field. But uh, given my uh, um, field of uh, uh, work, I would say in finance, you will see a great impact. Right, so you already have seen what is happening in uh, finance in terms of fintech. So that is why, if I want to suggest a student to follow, they can look at the fintech. That is what is happening there. We have cryptocurrencies, which is replacing digital currency or the normal currencies. That that is, you are uh, encrypting the money in, in instead of of uh, printing them. Right. So which is a, which is totally different concept. Or you see all the companies now have chatbots. That means you are talking to, to a computer instead of a human, right? Or we have AIs that can make uh, all uh, insurance and finance company to work more efficiently, right? So uh, these are the areas that uh, probably a student can look into and uh, learn about them. Uh, and I think that has a great future if, uh, if you really want to invest in it. Lovely, thank you so much, some great points. Um, question for Lewis. <laughs> As a student who became inspired to launch a digital business, what advice would you give someone with the big ideas in digital but not sure where to start? Well, as, obviously, as a student, I, I feel like the amount of resources you have at your disposal is just, well, it's, it's fast, you know. Um, like, as I said earlier, me as a business student, I've spoken with people in all different areas, such as engineering, computer science, maths, um, marketing, like finance, so many different areas which all encompass with each other to, to create a business. You know, um, I was sort of harked back. So I started the business startup journey, which is a program run at the university. At the university. Uh, I did that last year. And um, I joined it with, without an idea. I didn't know if I, what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to sort of explore the idea of maybe creating a business. Um, and through the process, they sort of got you to think in completely different ways to what you do. Even on my course, um, I was sort of understanding not necessarily business ideas that would create me money. It was more of business ideas that could benefit well, society and sort of the future. Um, and then halfway through this, I sort of had the idea of the reality rooms, which... I wanted to sort of uh, hit a point in the market which I felt was really um, undercapitalized currently. Obviously, with escape rooms, the fundamental issue is as soon as you play one room, um, you, you're not going to have the repeat customer because they know the puzzles, they know the all the elements of the of the game. So it's very hard to have repeat customers. When and I, we were sort of exploring different ideas, and I and I was really interested in virtual reality. So. 
I thought what what could what application could that apply for? Um, and from that is sort of having the idea of putting someone in a in a virtual world so they're not limited by the physical boundaries. Um, and also with with the ability to adapt the room on the fly. So have, uh, for example, someone do one puzzle, which would then in turn cascade effect and change the ending of the game, say. So there would be this constant repeatability that somebody could play the same room twice and never had the same, never have the same outcome. So working within the startup journey, which I was fortunate enough to win at the um, within the end, uh, it's really sort of elevated me to a different level. I've been able to talk with different people. Uh, I was put in contact with 3D modelers. I was put in contact with uh, the aspect of 3D printing, which is what stemmed my other idea. Um, and I feel that if you have this idea and you really have this desire to sort of do something digital and do something that can really sort of change the future, you know, use the opportunities that that as a student you get, you know, it hasn't got to just be so concrete within your course. You can you can branch out a lot wider and you can speak to all different types of people. You know, on, on, the, on the journey, it was, we had people from all different uh, aspects of the university. You know, they weren't all just business students. Uh, which is really interesting to see the different viewpoints and what they felt would be a uh, one a viable, both an impactful business idea um, and sort of building this rapport with people and talking and sort of gaining understanding of what other people want was, was key. Um, and sort of following on from my points I said earlier, uh, sort of gaining research and knowledge and, and building not only your educational standpoint but your overall package as a person and have the ability to talk with people to sort of put yourself out there i've gained so much more opportunities from simply putting up a say a linkedin post to do to do with the startup journey um which has sparked conversations with various different people and i've had the vast opportunities within different industries now to sort of implement what i can do which has elevated my business to another level so i do feel that if you have an idea and if you really, really think that you want to push this idea and you want to, and you want to be a business owner, talk with people and find people that will help you elevate that, whether it's free through a program or simply asking a lecturer, they're more, they're more than happy to help, you know, you, you, especially now on teams, you can just shoot them uh, a message and, uh, and normally they reply very quickly. So having this vast amounts of resources, utilize it whilst you're at, at university or, or even school. Lovely. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, panel. We've had an amazing discussion with some amazing points that have been raised. Thank you all for really providing us with valuable, valuable insight with your knowledge. And I hope that this discussion has been fun for everyone as well. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.